Well, welcome everyone to the National Fair Tax Webinar. I'm your host, Mark Maneri, and I'm joined by my colleague and fair tax superstar. He's laughing when he hears me say that. Uh, my colleague, Larry Walters, who has just been uh, an amazing volunteer um, and has is a man that is more dedicated to this than anybody I've ever met. And uh, so I'm excited to have him on here as I always am because he's just a wealth of knowledge. So uh, it's just eight o'clock now. So we're going to get started here momentarily, but I want to just give everyone a quick idea of what the next 45 minutes to an hour is going to look like. I'm going to give about a 20 minute overview of the main general points of the fair tax and its merits. And then we're going to stop and take questions, and then we're going to hit the special topic, uh, which actually is going to change for tonight because we're so close to the election. I thought it'd be appropriate to talk about where do these candidates stand on the fair tax? What do they say about it? Um, and just have a real hard look at, at their position on the fair tax. And we can engage in some healthy dialogue and maybe even some bait, some debate there. And then we'll finish up with any remaining questions. So uh, just so you know, everybody is muted. And we've got a lot of people on the line tonight, which is fantastic. Because I know people are busy. So we appreciate your time in advance. So just to let you know, also, the best way to interact with us is do one of two things. In your control panel, on the towards the bottom of the control panel, there's a place where you can type in your questions. So as questions arise when I go through this, please do write them in and or put up your hand. And when you do that, when it comes time for the first break and, and then after the special topic, we will take all of your questions and my colleague Larry and I will be answering all of them. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we do have a number of people still joining fast and furiously as we do minutes after 8 p.m., but I want to respect everyone's time and, and get rolling here. So when it comes to explaining the fair tax, I always start out by saying three words to describe it. Simple, fair, and transparent. And I love this slide because it's no question that our current tax code is anything but simple. Obviously, it's the exact opposite. It's, you know, with all of its amendments and, and all the pages in it now is approaching, I think it actually has eclipsed the 75,000 page mark. And there's an interesting study done. I don't remember exactly how many uh, were involved, but there was a number of uh, accountants uh, tax attorneys and, and IRS auditors who were all given the same tax return. I think the number was 30. And at the end, they all came out with a different result. So even the very best, the quote unquote experts who should know our tax code inside and out, can't get it consistent. Uh, and, it, and how could they? Nobody, no one person can memorize over 75,000 pages of a tax code. And so you know, I always say that our country is so great for so many reasons because we've evolved in so many areas. Well, one way that we, we need to evolve is in our tax code. And so we've got to get simpler. And the fair tax is that answer. You know, the fair tax uh, is legislation that exists right now in Congress known as H.R. 25 in the House, S13 in the Senate. And the fair tax is 131 pages double spaced. That's it. You know, I've read the legislation and virtually any lay person that keeps themselves abreast of tax issues uh, or who at least cares about it can read through it and, and understand it. And really, in my opinion, and, and I think those that support the fair tax would totally agree with that. Um, and so we'll get into more of that and why Congress tends to like a very complex tax code. We'll get to talking about that a little bit later on in the presentation. But the fair tax is very, very simple. So what is it? How does it work? Very simple. We will eliminate all personal and corporate income taxes, as well as payroll taxes and all the other taxes that you see on the screen. Um, and we will replace that with a national retail sales tax. A sales tax is also called a consumption tax, right? So uh, I actually, I just want to check in uh, with my colleague, Larry, and make sure he sees my screen 
advancing so I'm uh, so everybody is with me. Larry, can you see my screen? I sure do. Okay. New federal government revenue model. Perfect. Thank you. So we eliminate all those taxes you saw on the last screen. And now we have a national retail sales tax to the tune of 23 cents out of every dollar spent at the retail level. And then two really important check marks you see. There's no tax on business to business production costs and there's no tax on used goods. So a great example I like to use, um, and I use it over and over, but it's just a real uh, comprehensive example of how the fair tax would work is a business that's a home builder. So when a home builder builds a new home, they've got all kinds of inputs that go into building that home. You know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of different things they need to purchase from the land to the all the way down to the screws uh, that hold all the boards and, and everything else together. So when they purchase those inputs, the fair tax is not levied. When they finish that home and they sell it for the very first time at the retail level, uh, the first consumer who purchases that, they will pay the fair tax. And so let's say for simplicity purposes, the, the price of that home was $100,000. Well, the fair tax is inclusive in all retail goods and services. And what that means is uh, the price, the sticker price includes the fair tax embedded in it, which means that the consumer who purchases that home for a hundred grand spends a hundred grand. They don't pay a hundred thousand dollars times 23% added on top. They don't pay $123,000. No, they pay a hundred grand. And then that home builder sets aside the $23,000 and remits that to their state sales tax bureau. Now, when that consumer lives in the home and then they go to resell it, it's now considered a used good. And the second consumer and every other consumer for that matter, who purchases it on every other resale for in the future into perpetuity, they will never pay fair tax on that because again, it's considered a used good. So again, just for clarity purposes, retail goods and services, the fair tax is levied and the consumer pays and the fair tax is embedded inside the price of that good. On a good on a business to business transaction, the fair tax is not levied. Okay? Now, services, all services, every time a service is executed, it's considered the very first time um, for obvious reasons. So the fair tax would be levied on all service transactions. All right. So that is the fair tax in a nutshell in terms of its financial, uh, or how it works financially to fund our federal government. Now, by the way, the fair tax is revenue neutral when it comes to raising enough revenue for the federal government to operate on, which means that in its first year, it will generate the, the same amount of revenue that the IRS collects today, right? And then it's actually expected to collect more and raise more money for the federal government because as you'll see in just a minute, the fair tax will do some amazing things to rocket our economy forward. And so uh, if businesses are making more money, if they're selling more units and, and consumers are buying more as a result, uh, then the federal government is going to benefit from that. All right, so now let's talk about our current retail pricing system. So right now, business income taxes are passed off to the consumer. So it's suggested that there's business income taxes, but anyone who really studies a pricing system knows that those prices are simply, or, or excuse me, that expense is really a line item for a business and it's passed off to the consumer and reflected in the price of all goods, right? I often use the example of a $100 pair of designer jeans. And so let's say the retailer wants to have um, a 20% profit when they sell a $100 pair of jeans at the retail level. Well, that means that $80 that goes into the to that good sold at $100 is their cost. Well, one of the line items in that cost is their business income taxes. And so, in effect, the consumer is paying that 
when they pay $100 for that pair of jeans. So uh, we call that the embedded tax. And across all industries, if you look at the second bullet point there, it's approximately 22% in all retail goods on average across all business verticals. And so what happens when the fair tax gets passed is that embedded tax of 22% comes out because business income taxes and then the cost to comply to the federal tax code, those costs come out and the fair tax of 23% goes in. And so then the question is, okay, so what is going to happen to retail prices once the fair tax goes into effect? Well, the honest answer is we don't know, but our best estimate is that they're going to go up by perhaps 5 to 10% on average across all industries. Uh, and then as the marketplace gets more competitive because businesses have more capital as well as access to more capital because of the fair tax, then we expect those prices to come down to pre-fair tax levels. Uh, through general marketplace competition. So it's really important to understand this because those who take the position, those politicians and lobbyists, I should say, that take the position of opposing the fair tax and even demagoguing the fair tax will simply say, well, we don't support raising taxes by 23%. Of course, they don't mention that um, all income taxes go away at both the business and, and consumer level. Um, they don't mention that payroll taxes go away. They don't mention that capital gains taxes and the alternative minimum tax go away and all those other taxes we saw in one of the first screens. They simply say that taxes go up by 23%. Uh, so that's demagoguery in its purest form. And it's really important that you know that because – a lot of people, when you explain the fair tax, will say, yeah, but aren't pricing going to go up by 23%? No. They might go up by 5 or 10% in its first year or two, and then they're going to start to come back down. But the average American income is going to go up by 29% across the board. And so if that's true, if the average American income goes up by 29% and prices have gone up by let's say at the very high end, 10%, they're still going to make out by 19% better, right? So really, really important math to understand. Now, think about this. If the average American's income goes up by 29% because they get to keep 100% of the take-home pay, there's no more federal tax withholdings. Think about it. They're going to have more disposable income than ever before. Um, it was suggested in a study that if the average American had an additional five to seven hundred dollars uh, in monthly income, that we could stave off ninety percent of foreclosures. And so, right there, you would have a huge positive impact on the economy. Foreclosures are still happening at an epidemic rate, right? But in in general, if you've got consumers making a lot more money with more disposable income, they're going to spend more money. And then you've got businesses uh, who are making more sales because consumers are spending more money. Plus, they've got more capital and access to more capital, uh, which means that they're going to grow and expand and create more jobs. And then more jobs mean that people are going to make more money. They've got more disposable income. They spend more. Businesses keep expanding. And so it's this amazing positive cycle, and it is by far uh, the greatest economic stimulus we could ever have. So that's what will happen when we institute the fair tax, and more on that in just a minute. Now, so we've talked about simple. Let's talk about fair. Fair tax is fair because of the prebate. The prebate is part of the fair tax legislation that stipulates no one will pay federal tax up to the poverty level in spending. What do we mean by that? So what I want you to do is move your eyeballs to the right-hand side of the screen. This is the prebate schedule. Um, the annual consumption allowance, take a look at that. 
So the annual consumption allowance up to the poverty level based on the size of your household was determined by the Department of Health and Human Services in the federal government, independent of any fair tax legislation. Well, the prebate suggests that we will reimburse all qualifying households, regardless of income, on their poverty level limit spending every single month. So, for example, if you look at a married family household with two dependents, so look at the number four on that line, move your eyeballs across, they will have spent 29420 on poverty level limit spending, meaning they're basically spending only on the basic necessities of life, um, and that is determined to be about 29 grand over the course of the year. Which means if you multiply that by 23%, the fair tax they would have paid on those goods and services up to the poverty level limit spending, it'll roughly be $6,700 divided by 12 months. And the far right column says that every single month at the beginning of the month, that family will receive $564, reimbursing them in advance for the poverty level limit spending that they will do that month just on the basic necessities of life. So really important because, again, demagoguers of the fair tax will say, oh, the fair tax is really bad and it really hurts lower income class Americans. Not a chance. Number one, their income is going to go up on average by 29% by taking home 100% of their paycheck. Number two, they get the prebate, which reimburses them, them on poverty level limit spending. Number three, they can choose to purchase used goods on things like home, vehicles, clothing, etc., uh, and save money there as well. So the prebate creates fairness, and every qualifying household, regardless of income, will get the prebate, but especially there's a windfall for lower income class Americans and middle income class Americans for that matter. All right. So what are the benefits of the fair tax? Well, the big benefit I explained earlier is the domino effect. Businesses are going to have access to capital and gain more capital. A big part of that is bullet point number one. $11 trillion is estimated in U.S. offshore accounts and personal and corporate wealth. That money flows back into our economy. Why? Because wealthy Americans and businesses will do what they do with their capital, what they do best. They will reinvest it in their business. They will grow. They will expand. They will hire people, create jobs. People make more money. They'll have more disposable income. They spend more. And this amazing domino effect continues to transpire. And, 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 and it, the fair tax injects rocket fuel into our economy in year one. Number two, U.S. becomes a corporate headquarter haven. Why? We'll have the lowest effective corporate tax rate in the world, zero, which means jobs. Dozens, hundreds of companies are going to relo relocate their international headquarters here. They're going to build buildings. They're going to build infrastructure. They're going to hire, it's, again, more jobs. And then if you look at that last bullet point for the federal government, the underground economy, which is estimated at a trillion dollars, will pay their fair share. So anyone, any illegal alien for that matter, or a drug dealer, or anyone who is sidestepping illegal the, the federal tax code now and not paying taxes, well, every time they go out and they buy a pair of shoes or a new car or a new house or whatever, they're going to pay their fair share. And that's a new revenue, for, new revenue stream for the federal government. So... A fair tax, again, is rocket fuel for our economy, and it just makes incredible sense. It allows small businesses, and all businesses for that matter, to grow and expand without the burden of a progressive income tax that stifles growth right now. Think about it. The more money an individual or a business makes, they get penalized for it. So instead of reinvesting that additional income back into their business and expanding, they have to pay tax on it. So it just makes sense that we allow businesses to thrive in their income and reinvest that money into their growth and, they, and, and that we pay taxes based on consumption. All right, so how is this thing going to get collected? Well, right now, 45 states currently collect a state sales tax. 
So that infrastructure is already in, in place. And immediately at the federal level, we get 80% more efficient. So now we only collect from 18 to 20 million businesses as opposed to 120 million households. There's only one state sales tax form to fill out and the states and retailers are paid 0.25% collection of the national sales tax. What that means is there's gonna be a state sales tax bureau for every state. They will be responsible for collecting the fair tax from all the retailers and businesses in their state. And once they collect it, they will pass it on to the Department of the Treasury. Now they're incentivized to collect by they get getting to keep 0.25% of all revenue that they collect. And that's how they'll fund themselves and ensure that they police it right and that they collect every penny that is due to them. All right. So given everything that I've suggested thus far, who in their right mind could oppose the fair tax? It's simple, it's fair, it's very transparent. It's transparent because when you go and buy that $100 pair of jeans at the mall, when you get your receipt, it says $77 went to the business and $23 went to federal tax. Well, if you ever go and buy that pair of jeans and you see that all of a sudden $24 or $25 or $26 has gone to the federal government in, in national tax, well, what you know what the heck's going on. And you're going to get on the phone, you're going to call your politician, and you're going to say, fix this and revert it back to the original level, or you're out of a job. Well, right now, when a politician wants to collect more revenue, they pull a lever and they manipulate one of the 75,000 pages of the tax code, and the American public doesn't know anything about it. We don't know any difference. And they want to keep it that way so that they can create projects and get them paid for without us having to know about it or having to explain it to the American public and be held accountable, accountable for it. So anyone whose income is currently derived from the federal tax code, um, and so we talked about politicians, they benefit from the current tax code. The lobbyists, 50% of all lobbyists are, are tax lobbyists hired by wealthy corporations to manipulate the tax code on behalf of the wealthy corporation in their favor. And they get paid a healthy six or seven figure salary to do it. Now get this, for every dollar spent on a lobbyist salary, it returns $6 to that corporation in the form of corporate income tax savings. Crazy. So here we are, we've got 50% of top lobbyists in the pockets of politicians manipulating tax code and policy in the favor of a handful of wealthy corporations. Doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And of course, the IRS probably doesn't love it because they're going to get defunded after three years. Uh, and some accountants who only work on tax returns. Now, think about this, though. Anytime a consumer wants to go get credit from a bank or get a loan for anything, they're going to need to shoot, show and prove documented income. And right now we do that via tax returns. Well, when tax returns go away, there's going to be great demand for accountants and even former IRS workers that can document consumer income. So there are going to be huge opportunity there that they could evolve into. So um, those are the main points of the fair tax. The benefits, how it works, how it's collected, and who's opposed to it. So um, I want to take a moment and pause here, and I want to just see if we've got any questions written in, and we do. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to ask my colleague Larry to take himself off mute. And we're going to go ahead and, and ask your questions and get them answered for you, and then we're going to go ahead and... and Go into the special topic and talk about the congressional scorecard. And, and then we'll go back and answer your questions if there's anything left. All right. So let me just get pull up these questions here. 
Okay, so Kim asks a good question and she says, could you delineate what is included in the term services since these are also taxed? Larry, do you want to tackle that one? Sure enough, Mark. And uh, I have been responding to a couple of questions that were on the system while you were talking there. So sure. this is an add-on to some of uh, what had already been discussed. Okay. Serv services, Kim, would be, for example, a, a plumber who, whose labor or an electrician whose labor is added. That is a service. Uh, the materials, of course, we can understand that as being a good. Also, if there were legal fees, the fees that the attorney would uh, apply to whomever is hiring him, whether it be the builder, the buyer, or the seller, that fee, that service itself would be taxed. So, but basically, uh, when it comes down to the services, uh, you have to look at it from the perspective of what is the service, and is it something that is dedicated to a particular consumer? And that's where the application for service, for a tax on the service would be. Mark? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Larry. Okay. Uh, Rob asks a question, how would this affect states with regard to their state, or excuse me, with their sales taxes, would they ever repeal them? I don't think the states would ever repeal their sales tax. I think what you would find is that states with an income tax would repeal their income tax. Um, once they saw the benefits of it happening at the federal level, um, of the economy growing, uh, of the federal government raising more revenue for itself, uh, I think you'd find that they'd, raise, they'd increase, marginally increase their state sales tax rate um, in order to replace the income generated by state income taxes. In fact, there's a number of states right now that are much further along than at the federal level um, that are thinking about moving to a state sales tax replacing, completely replacing their state income tax. Larry, anything else you'd add to that? No, you've covered that one very well. The one thing that we do anticipate is that some states, and more likely those who have an income tax, initially anyway, would comply with the fair taxes tax base. In other words, they would go to a sales tax because once once the fair tax is implemented and there are no longer federal tax returns to be filed, that basis of information that is always used by a state with an income tax goes away. And so the state then would either have to create a new way or a new basis from which their income tax can be calculated or they can go with the sales tax, comply with the same tax basis that the fair tax is. In other words, there's no exemptions, everything is taxed equally, there's no exceptions, no loopholes type of a thing, and move on from that perspective. So it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of variability here and it's going to be up to the states on how they choose to handle that, Mark. Yeah, thanks Larry. Uh, the next question was asked by three different people. Uh, and I'll speak it as Norm wrote it in, and then it addresses David and Gina as well. Um, what if the market for used stuff and goods greatly increases while the market for new goods gets smaller? Is this factored in to the 23%? And if not, won't it raise the 23% number? And David's point was he thinks that uh, sales of new products would become substantially reduced. Uh, the answer to that is we don't know until it happens, of course. However, there is overwhelming evidence to suggest that it is absolutely not going to happen. Why? Because it is demonstrated that consumption increases with income. And so think about it. Think about it right now. Right now, you could go out and buy something used that's cheaper than something new. Um, and part of the Part of the, the hole in this theory is that something new is going to cost dramatically more than something used, like 23% more because they're thinking, they're thinking with the mindset that prices are going to increase by 
And remember what I talked about earlier in the presentation, they're not. Prices are only going to go up by 5 to 10% initially in that first year and then come back down. But average income is going to go up by 29% or even more. So uh, people are going to have more disposable income than ever before. And it's been demonstrated that as income increases, spending increases, um, and retailers do much better, which means people are purchasing more new goods when they make more money. Now, why is that? Because we live in a capitalistic market driven society where we uh, people purchase based on value, not on price. That is demonstrated over and over and over again across the board in all industries. Now, obviously, people are out there spent, um, purchasing used goods every once in a while to save some money, but that's the exception, not the rule. You know, think about it. Why do brands like Ritz Carlton and Mercedes Benz and uh, designer jeans, and, you know, we could come up with a million different examples. Why do those industries and, and, and businesses continue to thrive even in down times? Because people with money, want quality and new is associated with quality. So the bottom line is, yes, people are gonna have the option to purchase used goods, but with more disposable income than ever before, we're gonna find that people are gonna purchase new because typically speaking, um, Americans purchase goods and services based on quality, not based on price. Larry? Yeah, that's exactly true, Mark. Uh, the other facet of this is that there will only be a limited amount of used goods available in any market, houses, cars, boats, uh, clothing, whatever the case might be. And so the, uh, in, in order for that, if it, let's say that that used market does become scarce, then people are going to be compelled to go to the new market. On the other side of that, though, we have to remember that we are a consuming nation and that the one thing that has made us great as an economy is competition, the free marketplace. So if, if used houses, for example, are selling better because they're a lower price than a new home, I would see that the new home market would start adding some kind of an incentive to their offer, uh, maybe a large screen TVs or an audio system for the home, or totally wired for for internet and and uh, HD video. There's lots of things that they can do to make their product more desirable than the used product. And so the free market is what will cause that balance to ultimately take place. Mark. Yeah. You know, and I just think about it today. Like even before the fair tax gets implemented, you look at it today. And you look at that example of buying a new home. In fact, interestingly enough, I have a I have a very close I have a newly married couple who are close friends of ours, and they were just in the market for purchasing a new home, and they had set aside a certain amount of money. So they went out house shopping, uh, house shopping, and they looked at a lot of uh, resold homes, and then they looked at new builds, and they ended up buying a new build because it was a great deal, and the builder was throwing in a number of incentives, but guess what? The new build costs more money than the, than the resale homes, but they had enough disposable income where they decided they wanted to spend a little bit extra money because they perceived higher quality and higher value with the new build. Um, and typically that's how buying behavior happens in a, in a consumption-based society like ours. So, um, all right, so we've, uh, we've, we've got, We've taken all the questions off the table, and those are great questions. So now what I want to do is I want to quickly uh, look at the presidential candidate fair tax scorecard. And I called an audible on this because we're, we were it was slated to look at how states with uh, just a state sales tax and no income tax do um, economically versus states with a sales tax and an income tax. Uh, and it's a great special topic, but I figured this is the last fair uh, tax webinar before the, the election coming up here in another week or two. And I thought it'd be appropriate just to look at their scorecards and where each candidate stands on the fair tax. So um, 
obviously Obama and Romney are the two main candidates. And I wanted to include Gary Johnson here because he's on he's on the ballot in 47 states. He's a libertarian candidate. Gary Johnson uh, was in the Republican primary, uh, and then he moved over to the Libertarian Party so he could be hurt. Um, you know, and it would be interesting. It would be an interesting webinar to talk about the need for a third party, uh, but that obviously doesn't relate directly to the fair tax. But anyway. Um, Gary Johnson staunchly supports the fair tax. He talked about it in the in the Republican primaries, um, and and as I'll show you in a second, it's on his website. Uh, President Obama. He never actually has addressed the fair tax directly, but the assumption has been made that he opposes it because it raises burden on uh, the middle class families, or what he thinks raises the burden on middle class families. Um, and Governor Romney has actually commented on the fair tax. And if you go to fairtax.org, which is exactly where I pulled this information from, uh, there's a there's a YouTube video where the only clip that he that that I've ever seen him actually address the fair tax. He likes the idea of a consumption tax, but says uh, that it's it's going to hurt middle income class Americans. And I don't know this for sure, but it's my position that he. Uh, says that because his uh, the fair tax from a political standpoint is risky uh, because it's so easy for the opponent to demagogue it and sip it and uh, pigeonhole the supporter by simply saying that my opponent wants to raise taxes by 23 percent and so the, the demagoguers use the fair tax as a way to um, throw egg on the face of their opponent, and they use fear tactics to do it. So that's my opinion. But that's where these three gentlemen stand on the fair tax publicly. And then what I wanted to show, this is Gary Johnson's website. You can see the URL up there. Um, what The reason why I wanted to show you this, and I've got one more to show you, is because when, when um, our congressmen and women say that they a lot of politicians say they support the fair tax and a lot of them pay lip service to it just so they can get the votes. Well, the one way to determine whether or not a, a candidate black and white really truly supports the fair tax is if it's in their written material. And so right here on his website uh, on the economy and taxes issue, he's saying we got to do three things. And point number two is completely retool the U.S. taxism and enact the fair tax. He says it right here. And then I have one more for you. Uh, this is from Congressman Todd Long, who's running in a, in a newly created district here, District 9, for Congress. Uh, he says right here in the middle of it that he's for supporting the fair tax. And so with this, yes, the presidential election is coming up. But if you're, if you're on this webinar and you're wondering whether or not to vote in favor of your con congressional representatives or senators, uh, and you want to know if they support the fair tax, go to fairtax.org, number one, and look at, uh, the, they'll have information on that for you, uh, whether or not your, your congressman or woman uh, will support the fair tax. But also go to their website and look at their printed material. And if it's in their website and it's printed for the public to see, then you know they're a true supporter. Larry, anything else you want to mention on that? Uh, no, Mark, that's just pretty plain and simple. You've explained it fine. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Um, let's just go here and see if we've got any more questions, and um, and then we can wrap it up. We uh, oh, I heard some David just wrote in that Gary Johnson is now on the ballot for forty nine states. So thank you, David. Appreciate that. Um, this is interesting, actually. Um, John wrote in that a vote for Gary Johnson, li the Libertarian, is a vote for Obama. And why would anyone waste their vote like that? And th that might be interesting. There's no more questions. So um, I I'd be interested to get, Larry, your take on that, whether or not you think a vote for Gary Johnson, the Libertarian candidate who supports the fair ta tax openly, is necessarily a vote for uh, Obama. <laughs> Okay, Mark. Well, 
Uh, you've got me on a, on a sickly pine here because we're talking uh, politics now and we're supposed to be nonpartisan. Personally, I think it is, and I won't say any more than that. Yeah, right on. The fair tax is definitely uh, neutral, um, and we need both sides to, to come together for it. Um, but fair point. So we'll pass on that, but John, we certainly appreciate you writing in and, and sharing your opinion on that. So, um, you know, if there aren't any other questions, last minute questions that get written in, then um, we'll just take a look here, see if there's any more written in. Mark? Yeah, go ahead, Larry. I see, I see other questions on my control panel. I don't know why you're not seeing them. Okay, well, go ahead and address them. I, I only see... I only see a handful of uh, comments here, but Larry, if there's any other questions, then go ahead and, and handle them. Okay. John, uh, John Vitell, whom I've dialogued with quite a bit on the uh, internet, uh, he has the question, I feel that the 22% embedded tax is overstated. That would mean that we would effectively pay a 1% tax, which is the difference between 22% and 23% and get an income tax elimination that would equate to at least 15% and probably more, or probably more like the 22%. Well, John, this, this is really a more complex issue than, uh, than we see on the surface because the actual embedded costs of any product or service has got to take into account how many employees, how many wage earners did it take to produce that product per year? And if you've got a product where it takes one wage earner to produce one product per year, then the entire cost of that employee, that wage earner, is embedded in the cost of that one product. However, if we have one employee, one wage earner producing a thousand products per year, then one one thousandth of that wage earner's costs would be embedded in the cost of that particular product. So you see, I've taken some extremes there, but I, I hope that illustrates the fact that it is not just a matter of taking the averages, which is what the research did. The research literally said that there is between 20 and 25 percent of embedded taxes in the cost of everything we buy. That's what it said. However, when we consider what I just explained about how many wage earners it takes to produce something, you can see where that average has a very, very broad expanse. And so it's kind of difficult to say. Uh, the, the best we can do is, is take the estimates on a static level. And when the fair tax is implemented, then we'll see what shakes out of the laundry here and how the costs really apply. Okay, Mark, on that one, I can't, I can't add anything to that. Maybe you can. Um, I can't. I mean, I think you handled it as best as I could as well, and you know the numbers a little bit better than me. Okay, I'm going to delete that one. What's next here? I got another one from John uh, responding to Kim. The fair tax would be paid only once, true, by the buyer of the new home, true. The builder would not pay any fair tax on the subcontractors of the material or the materials. That is true. Uh, that go into the home. Okay, so John made a statement there in response to a question that Kim has asked, and John is 100% on on that one. Thank you, John, very much. We're gonna have to get you uh, as part of the team here on the webinar presenters list and see if we can't uh, utilize you someday down the down the road. Uh, another one from John. The builder is normally the seller of the new home. The developer is the person that develops the subdivision, puts in the roads and other infrastructure, creates the lots. Okay, I cannot argue that. That's in response to a, uh, a message that I have responded to uh, defining the difference between a builder and a, and a developer, considering the possibility that the builder is not necessarily selling to the end user. Once again, it's another variable that, uh, that could come to pass. And what John is saying is not untrue, so we'll just accept that at face value. Thanks again, John. Uh, one more here from Ed Ristenblatt. The states around me 
who have income tax and sales tax right now add up to around 9 to 10 percent. So if they stop charging income tax, would they not raise their sales tax up to the 9 to 10 percent mark? John, that, uh, Ed, rather, that's a good question. And if you look at it as a one-for-one -one basis, yes, that is true. However, if that same state was to stop exempting many of the items that they now exempt from the sales tax, in other words, if they broaden their tax base, the tax rate could actually come down a little bit. Uh, once again, that's a matter of some arithmetic and what that particular state's sales tax revenue is uh, throughout the year and how they handle that. But if we get rid of the exemptions, if they get rid of the exemptions, well, hey, let me give you another example. Florida was looking at replacing the property tax with a sales tax several years ago. And what they found is that if they removed most of the exemptions, they were still a couple that they were going to leave, but if they removed most of the exemptions, the sales tax on the state would go from 6% down to something under 4%. Gives you an example of how the numbers of the tax rate itself can change depending on what the tax base is. I uh, hope that answers your question, Ed. Thank you very much. Uh, next one uh, from John Vitell again. Yeah, John, we're going to hire you here. You can get paid the same thing we do. <clears throat> Uh, if the supply of used homes decreases because of increased demand, the prices will rise relative to new homes. That is a true observation, John, thank you. And once again, we're talking about the competition of the free market. Uh, supply and demand is what dictates the price. And if people are cons if consumers want something bad enough, they will cause the prices to go up. By, from those people who are selling it. Thank you, John. Uh, another John. How about tasking someone to research which congressmen and their opponents support the fair tax? Uh, that's, a, that's a big job. We could task someone, but as volunteers, we cannot always find a volunteer willing to undertake those kinds of projects, John. Uh, maybe that's something that you would consider doing. I now put that back in your lap. Thank you, John. Uh, another one from John. That number comes from the initial study, 22%. That includes the elimination of the tax paid by the employee, which would not reduce the cost. It would be refunded to the employee. Uh, I've got to read that again. I'm a little confused on that one. That number, the 22%, includes the elimination of the tax paid by the employee, which would not reduce the cost. Okay, that's true, and I've argued this many times. What John is explaining here is that the 22%, the 20 to 25% that was identified by the research economists on this project included the tax, which would be your federal withholding tax that the wage earner has deducted from his paycheck, plus his Social Security, and his Medicare and uh, future FUTU tax, et cetera, those are all considered taxes now and ta under the income tax system. When we go under the fair tax system, those withholdings would no longer be held from the employer's or from the employee's paycheck. The wage earner would no longer have those deductions, but he is still getting paid that money, and therefore the cost of the product or the cost of business by the employer does not go down by the amount of those withholdings. And so that's why we estimate that the reduction in cost through the supply chain maybe is anywhere in the area from uh, 10 to 12, 15 percent, and then the fair tax would get added to that. Thank you, John, for that one. All right, let's see where we're going here. Uh, delete that one. Coming down again. John, you're hot. Uh, I think studies show that if a state used the fair tax template with the prebate, their state would come down. Their state rate would come down. Well, we agree with that, and I just kind of explained that. Thank you, John. We're on the same track there. And another one. I think studies show that if a state used the fair tax template with the prebate, hmm, we got that again. Okay. <clears throat> 
So I, I'm so darned busy working on this election that I would not have time to do that research. And, oh, John, come on, don't give me any excuses now. The election's over in 13 days, and you'll be free as a jaybird. So you can do it if you want to. Okay? Uh, what's next here? David C. David C. He's on the ballot in 49 states. Got that. Mark picked that one up. Thank you. Uh, Kim. There would be no fair tax on the products and services that go into a new home. There would be no fair tax on the products and services that go into a new home. That is, oh, this is John responding to Kim. Okay, that's true. The fair tax would be applied by the party who ultimately sells that new home to the end consumer. All right, you're welcome. What else? Another John. I agree with the 10 to 15 percent, so maybe it would be better to change your presentation from 22 percent to 15 percent. Yeah, we could change it in lots of ways, and all, all of them would be uh, somewhat right and somewhat wrong, and we'd have somebody else saying, gee, that's not right, John. Uh, you ought to change it to maybe 15 percent or 22 percent. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a win-win situation there, uh, so we'll go with it as it is for the time being. And hopefully we can explain why we're using that number and where it comes from. Okay, and yeah, but for what? This is from John, another John, but I don't know what this question was relating to or this comment was related to. Yeah, but for what? Question mark, question mark, question mark. John, if you would uh, elaborate a little bit more on that, we'll see what we can do about responding to it, okay? Thank you very much. That's all I've got. That's all I can see now, Mark, so it's, it's back to you. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and spending some quality time with us and getting educated on the fair tax. And, you know, as always, we say we want you to take some action here. So what can you do? Uh, number one, contact your elected official. Uh, and let them know how you feel about it. One of the best things you can do is write into them on a regular basis. Secondly, obviously, vote. Uh, so vote how you feel about this, the, the fair tax. If you've got people in your area at the congressional level then uh, who do or don't support the fair tax, then perhaps you can make the fair tax your core issue and you vote based on that. Um, obviously, you can give money. Go to fairtax.org and do that. Uh, they always are looking for some fundraising, and we need it. And most importantly, go to fairtax.org, go to grassroots, and get involved. Donate your time. And get out at the events um, and hand out literature and, and talk to people about the fair tax. So we thank you. Uh, it'll be an interesting election in the next couple of weeks. And then we'll break it down again. And we've got a great fair, uh, special topic coming for you next month. So stay tuned. And by the way, for those of you who are coming back, and we hope all of you will, and you'll bring somebody with you, we're going to present on the fifth Thursday. Of November. We usually present on the fourth Thursday, but the fourth Thursday in November is Thanksgiving, so we'll be delayed a week on that. Mark? Yep. Uh, I got one more comment question here I'd like to respond to. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, John clarified a little bit. He says, do the study on candidates. And then uh, John Vitell said, no point in doing that study on candidates after the election is there. That is somewhat true, but I would offer this thought, John, and to everyone listening tonight. We will have 435 House representatives, 50 U.S. Senators, and the research can be done on the position of these individuals with the thought in mind of looking for people who could replace them in the very next election, and that would be an important project. Uh, we do have we do have tax reform coming up next year in 2013. It's been it's been talked about by the by Congress. It's been promised. Uh, they've taken steps to have a tax reform plan released by the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee not later than April 30th of 2013. Now we know every one of these rascals are looking towards some form of a flat tax. Uh, I want to make every one of you aware, if you are not, that every single tax proposal on the table thus far, except 
the fair tax is a tax on income. And the way you can determine that is whether or not that particular tax proposal requires, requires the power of the 16th Amendment. The fair tax eliminates the 16th Amendment. Every other tax proposal requires it. So if we want to not have to put up with another income tax for the next 10, 12, 100 years, who knows how long, we need to really get our stuff together and be very active in pursuing our personal House representatives and our state United States senators and let them know that we are mustering forces that will replace them on their next re-election attempt if they so much as consider accepting any form of an income tax as a tax reform. The only true tax reform is the fair tax, a national consumption tax. It's clean, it's simple, it's transparent, as Mark had mentioned earlier, and it will do things that none of the income taxes will do. And I could go into some of the details of them. This is not the particular time for it, so I won't take that time. But uh, believe me, I've done some research on this, and every one of them are income taxes. Thank you, everybody. Good night. and. Uh, we won't talk to you, I guess, until after Thanksgiving. I wish all of you a Thanksgiving. And Mark, I turn it back to you. Good night, everyone. Thanks again, Larry. Have a great night. Have Mark, a are you still there? <laughs> yep. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, everyone. Take care.